taco meat. Hello. How you doing? And Aki, what's up? I, uh... I was trying to figure out if, uh... If I should call you backwards fit Pika or not. Uh... I'm currently making a, um... A kalimba for my friend Little Chook. So, in the last stream, we, uh... We cut the board. We put the sidewalls together. Um, basically just cut out this part, the sidewalls, and, um traced out the top and bottom, and then I split the uh, panel of wood apart, so I keep this fine. Okay, backwards Pika. Um, so these uh, pieces that I then glued while nobody was looking, um, but basically I cut the, um, the pieces out um, that we wanted to use from boards that I'd already glued together. So um, this uh, wood right here, the bright orange stuff, um, is called paduke, and then the lighter stuff here is um, hard maple. So yeah, so it it'll end up looking like I don't have the tines, so the end product will look like kind of like this. Only this one will be shorter, a little smaller, a little thinner, and. Um, uh, rounder, so, um, but then it'll sound like, you know, they sound sort of like a little music box. And then you can play songs. notes you know, that, are, that are on it. Um, so the last piece I'll have to do after today, we're waiting for the hardware to arrive. Um, this part I can't make. Um, I probably could make the sounding boards, the pieces that the, um, that the tines fit into. Um, these wouldn't be impossible, that's just a little routering that I could do, but it's actually easier just to buy them. So <laughs> I don't take any song requests. Um, <laughs> welcome in, Santa. Um, yeah, we're back in the workshop for a little bit. I need to finish up this piece that I started before. And so for comparison, you can see this is a little smaller. Um, if I put this at the height of that one, you can see it's a little bit thinner. And everything else is basically the same. So I use this sort of uh, other one that I built as a template for this one. But uh, I asked Chuk whether she wanted like a little hole or a bunch of little holes um, or one big hole. Uh, and she said she wanted to more or less look like this one, but be rounded like the one that I made for um, for uh, Rebecca, for Hannah Rebecca Music. Um, how long have I been doing woodworking? I started working on... Um, we bought a miter saw. Um, actually, I think my, my wife's... Uh, my father-in-law bought us a, a miter saw so that we could do some work on our... Um, porch in Lincoln when we lived there when we were getting our PhDs and we we're getting ready to move. Um, we we're trying to do some repairs to the house and so I basically learned how to use the miter saw kind of on the fly and then um, slowly started adding pieces. Hi little Chuk! We got the uh, um, kalimba glued together as you know um, and so that was uh, let's see, we moved here in 2012, so about 10 years I've been doing woodworking. Thank you for the anonymous one-bit cheer. <laughs> um, so about 10 years, and then I slowly started adding pieces. I asked for a table saw, and then once I got the table saw, I started building things like birdhouses and furniture. I have a jigsaw. Um, so I could make some fancier cuts. And then um, I got a, a router. Uh, uh, this is just a, um, a handheld router. And I also got a router table and uh, a planer. So I just slowly started adding pieces and then learning how to get really good at using them and, um, and doing what I wanted to. And then really um, about... Um, 
maybe five years ago, I started um, doing edge glue wood, like these hardwood things. And I built some cutting boards and some really simple projects with this. And it took me a while to get comfortable basically gluing wood together because I'd always screwed things together before that. And then um, once we got the planer, basically, I just, everything kind of changed and I started building stuff constantly that was mixed woods. And I built all kinds of things for, you know, our family here and for Christmas presents. And so I just basically trained myself how to do everything. Um, this past, uh, I guess maybe it was February or January, I bought myself a, um, uh, I'm pointing over here to my, uh, to my left, but there's a, a, a jig for doing uh, dovetails and so, um, or box joints. And I started building boxes. I built a box on stream. I don't know how long ago that was. Um, it's still not complete because we don't have the hinges on it yet, but it's just the hardware parts missing. Um, but I really wanted to start building some fancier stuff. And so for maybe five years, I've been doing kind of like high end stuff. Before that, I was mostly building things out of cedar so they could go outside or like furniture around the house. So <laughs> uh, what piece of work am I most proud of? Uh, that's a good question. I don't usually think about it that way. I just try to do my best on everything. Um, I made a really nice cutting board for Pacific Plankton, who's another streamer that um, uh, that's a friend of mine. And I think it's a really nice cutting board. I spent a lot of time on it, but I don't know if it's actually like my best work. It's just that it was kind of fun to do. And, you know, like I had to do a lot of planning around it. Um, but I've got a lot of kind of furniture around the house. We built a, uh, I built a, uh, a hammock stand for the front porch um, that we use all the time. It's just made out of four by fours. Um, I built my, my mom all kinds of things for bird feeders, bird houses, whatever. So, um, <laughs> is this what it's like to have your shit together? Uh, you can just be organized and creative. Uh, yeah, I guess it is. I don't know. Um, but so t yesterday we were sort of everything was uh, over here facing this way and today I'm mostly going to be routering uh, this piece so getting rid of the hard edges uh, and rounding them down and then sanding them down um, so that the piece is nice and smooth it feels good in the hands and then I'm going to be adding uh, normally for a lot of pieces that we do like for example for I do for this this one um, there's a clear coat on it and um, a clear coat's a really nice way to protect the wood, um, and it's very low maintenance, but it makes the wood feel kind of like plasticky. Um, it doesn't feel like real wood, because um, it's got basically a thin piece of, you know, painted plastic over top of it. It's polyurethane. And then um, I, I like the natural wood feel. So when I made the kalimba for Hannah Rebecca, and also the shaker that I made for Hannah Rebecca, we used this. Um, vitamin E, it's almond oil basically, and um, it requires that you do a little bit of treatment to the wood. You have to maintain it occasionally, like once every couple of months you have to kind of rub some oil on it. Um, but I actually like it because it makes the, makes the instrument, you're going to be holding it in your hand all the time. I feel like it's important that it feel like the instrument um, instead of feeling a little plasticky. I mean, I still really love the sound of this. It doesn't change the sound at all, it just changes the way it feels in your hand. So I've been focusing on trying to make the musical instruments that are handheld kind of like feel very um, comfortable, you know, even though they're boxy or blocky. So, hey, Dr. Derp, what's going on? Um, so we're going to, I'm going to have to mute between, <laughs> whenever I turn on power tools, it's going to be just the sound playing and I won't be able to interact with chat very much. But, um, uh, so hopefully nothing catastrophic happens where I knock the camera over or whatever, but um, you should be able to still see what's going on. And I have the camera set up like right on top of this, so you should be able to see what I'm um, what I'm cleaning up here. So um, you're doing a bit of spring cleaning. What's going on? What are you cleaning for? Okay, so I'm gonna put this uh, columb on the other side of the room. A lot of times when I'm working with stuff, if I'm cutting wood um, using the the table saw or the miter saw. Um, I'll wear a face mask, but um, 
my sander actually has a vacuum pulled in, pulls dust into the inside of it, so it traps it. And the router doesn't actually create that much like wood dust. It actually kind of makes wood chips, which I don't feel like I have any trouble um, breathing. None of these woods have anything toxic in them. They're just straight from the, uh, the lumber store. So, I do know how to play it. Well, I played a little bit of it, um, but I'm not like a kalimba expert. I just kind of like the sound of it. And so I learned how to play like, um, uh, the intro part to like Sweet Dreams from the Eurythmics and I learned how to play like Happy Birthday on it uh, for my daughter's birthday so I could play a little song for her and uh, I learned how to play uh, that Radiohead song that I was playing a, l a little bit ago um, but uh, I'm not trying to become a kalimba musician I just want to like uh, make sure it sounds good and that it's tuned so there is some smoke if I go fast enough, but I'm gonna probably not going to go that fast. All right, so um, thanks everybody for coming. I'm, I'm mostly making this uh, into a, um, a stream so that I can kind of showcase some of the work, but um, and I'm happy to do that, but I'm, I'm mostly trying to make it so that uh, so that little little Chuke can see me building the instrument that I'm building for her. So uh, she has some documentation of what, it, what I did to get it to the state where she sees it. So she saw me sort of block out the, uh, the box of the, uh, the sounding box, basically. Um, and then I took some pictures as I was gluing it together and clamping it together. Uh, we, we cut the hole last time. Um, what I did between this time and last time, so if you actually were here at the last stream, is uh, I ran a um, eighth inch round over uh, around the hole on both sides before I glued it and then I sanded it um, so that it's smooth here um, around the sounding board hole and it's because once you glue it together I wouldn't be able to get around to the inside so I wanted to make sure it was smooth before I glued it um, and then I put the frame pieces together so last time I just cut the frame pieces but I didn't actually cut the angles on the side walls so these side walls basically had to be cut um, it's the same eight degree angle, but I actually it's the complementary angle. So you know, because it's it's meeting into the eight angle board, eight degree board that's here. Um, so it's you know, 90 degrees minus eight, 81 degrees um, cut, and then um, and then I glued the frame together. Um, a technique that I like to use when I glue uh, frames together um, always is. Um, I just use some painting tape and I basically put the piece together the way that it's going to be put together with the tape on it and then I peel back a little bit of the tape, put the glue on it, tape it down. Um, normally I use a band clamp, so I have a band clamp that wraps around something and I can tighten it down um, or I just use my normal clamps. Um, once the frame was all glued together, so I did it all at once, um, I did the, some sanding on those pieces. Uh, to get rid of the excess glue and make sure everything was flat and then um, put some glue around the outside of it stuck the top and the bottom on and then clamped the face of those very tightly with basically all of my clamps so um, the face plate and the back plate basically were glued on and then I let it sit overnight this morning when I got up I um, I cleaned up these edges so that the um, the glue isn't on them and there's always a little bit of like the piece sort of sticking over the edge, so uh, I sand it off over the all, all the overlapping pieces. Sometimes I trim it with the router, but this morning I just did it all with the sander. Um, so I used the oscillating sander to basically make all the edges straight, and then now we're gonna um, we're gonna cut the a, a um, eighth of an inch round over onto um, all the way around the edges. So I'll have to clamp and unclamp it, um, turn it all the way around and then flip it over, do the whole thing. And then I like to just do the roundovers one step at a time. So we'll do an eighth inch roundover, and then I'll take the bit off of the router after I've done all the sides and do a, um, a quarter inch roundover. So it's a nice round edge. And then I don't think I wanna go to half, I don't think I wanna go to a half inch roundover. I think I could. Um, <laughs> yeah, I work very hard at, um, uh, I'll keep that at making sure that I don't uh, put myself in any kind of dangerous positions and I keep my fingers very carefully away from all of the um, equipment. I actually have a bunch of really cool um, devices to make sure that my hey little chick came up with a random uh, shout out. Um, 
uh, I have like a feather board for the table saw so I don't have to have my hands near it. I have feather boards for the router uh, table so I don't have to have my hands near the spinning equipment. Um, and so really the, um, and I, I don't put, ever put my hands near the entrance of the, uh, the planer. So really the only dangerous piece of equipment in the lab or in here in my wood shop, um, the router, if I put my hands near the actual router blade, which I would never do, I always unplug it when I go to change the, um, the bits. And um, the miter saw is actually kind of dangerous because uh, pieces of wood can sometimes um, chunk and get flung across the room. Fortunately, they usually get flung the other way because I have my head on one side of the blade and the, uh, the miter cuts the, flings them the other way. So I've never been hit by those. Um, but one time I was cutting stuff and the, um, uh, the chunked blade flew up and wedged itself in between the miter saw and the frame of the miter saw and caused it to actually bend the blade. Um, and it shut itself off automatically. So um, I had to replace the blade on it, but I didn't actually get hurt. Um, but yeah, I'm usually extra safe, and I always have my safety goggles on, although I don't have the kind that wrap around my face, but nothing ever kind of gets close to my head. So, all right, I'm gonna mute it for a little bit, and then you can listen to this, I don't know, lo-fi pretzel rock that's going on. And, uh, and I'll be routering around the sides, and then flipping it over, routing around the sides, and then I'll turn it back on so that um, uh, I can change the bits. That'll take some time, so. Who was that that just came in? Studio Cornix. Hey, Studio. It is router time. It's actually the, there's two magical times for me um, when I'm cutting a piece of wood and making it into something. And um, they're my favorite, favorite parts of, of the process. One is when I start using the router because the router takes all of these really ugly, sharp angles and makes them beautifully rounded and so it always makes whatever piece I'm doing look more appealing. Um, to me, it looks very blocky. Uh, it looks like a you know Minecraft kalimba right now. Um, and then um, the second thing is when we put the finishing coat on it. And so I asked Chuk what she wanted, and she told me she wanted to go with the oil. So I think at the end of the stream, we'll actually be able to put the first layer of oil onto this, so you can really see what the wood will look like um, when it's when it's finished, because it'll basically be done. And then um, the hardware will go on tomorrow off screen and the pain in the butt tuning, um, which is actually the probably the most difficult part of the kalimba is trying to get everything in tune. Um, but yeah, those are my favorite parts when you kind of like get to see what the piece will look like and get rid of the really angular edges to it. So those are like the two, two kind of magical moments for me for pieces because they really start to look different once you round the edges. Okay, so. I'll shut up for a bit and you can just watch and hang out if you like.
Hey Del. Uh, you're back at work. <laughs> That's too bad. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're working on a um, a kalimba for our friend Little Chook. So um, the um, the router is uh, up and running. So um, hopefully, yeah, you're feeling better. Yeah, it looks cool. Uh, it's going to get a little rounder here in a second, so I'm just working on the first stage of it. Um, I thought maybe I actually should talk a little bit about what the router is doing. So if you've never used a router, um, which I hadn't before I bought one, um, the the piece, it's unplugged right now, so everybody's safe. Uh, but the, um, the router actually has, um, this piece has a um, a rolling wheel and this rolls along the side of the piece of whatever piece of wood it has. So you can see this is like this brass, the shiny uh, um, round piece here. It rolls along the edge of the piece and it keeps me from basically cutting too deeply into the wood. And then the round over bit is um, um, here. So you can see there's two edges to it, and it's actually cutting the curve onto the face of whatever um, whatever we roll it up against. And so part of the reason I have to sand it before I start is basically to make sure that the roller doesn't hit bumps, because if it hits something bumpy, basically, then the edge that it cuts will be bumpy. So 
Um, but it also means that it's sort of idiot proof once you have it because as long as this is set to the right height, um, it will just cut the curve and you get a perfect rounded edge on the wood um, here that's perfectly straight and never cuts too deeply because it's rolling along um, the edge of the wood like this and cutting as it goes. So, um, and this was a uh, uh, an eighth of an inch round over, which means that um, it rounds one eighth of an inch deep um, off of the edge. And there's just a locking bolt in here um, to, to take the bit off. So I thought maybe it'd be helpful if I actually took the bit out so you could see it. Um, there, you can kind of see it's cutting this rounded edge where my finger is right there, that's the blade. And it's only cutting as deeply as this um, rolling piece will let it. So just hold that piece up against the edge. And as it spins, basically, it rounds the edge. Pretty simple. And um, now I'm going to switch from this 1 8th of an inch round over to this 1 quarter of an inch round over. So you can see it has a bigger, just has a bigger curve on it. Still has the same rolly wheel and then it just cuts a, a, a deeper, um, rounder edge. It's basically the width of my finger, almost perfectly, um, uh, out of the side of the wood. And the only problem is, like, so, if you're curious, could I go up a step? I can. This is the next one up. This is a half of an inch round over. So that would cut a half of an inch off of the edge. And then, you know, if you want to get nuts, um, there's a three quarters of an inch round over. So, but they all do exactly the same thing. This one would probably cut a hole that would, um, you know, like the face plate would be basically cut off of the instrument if I use this one. So it's way too much of a, of too deep of a cut. Um, and I'm not sure about this one, um, which is why I'm not sure I want to use something that's quite this rounded. Um, I could test it on a piece of wood and see if it would, you know, if it would actually cut my fear is that it actually cut the face plate off of um, the, the, um, where it's glued uh, if I cut too deeply. So the wood is basically an, an eighth, a little bit bigger than um, a quarter of an inch. So the round over probably should kind of match that. And there's other bits that are basically, you know, if you wanted to cut a straight chamfer like this, you could. Uh, it does the same thing. It has a rolly wheel, and then this one would just basically cut a, a chamfered edge onto it instead of um, instead of this curved edge. So you can see the differences between those bits. And this one is a trim, a trimming edge. So this one has a rolling wheel and just cuts straight. So if the top piece doesn't perfectly fit the side pieces, it will have to run this over the edge of it. Um, and then there's a bunch of other shapes, random shapes in here. Um, so if you're wondering how do they make molding, for example, um, it's just basically a piece of wood where they run a router along the edge of it. Um, and here you can um, you can use this to make sure that it doesn't ever get too aggressive, which is uh, good because routers are extremely dangerous pieces of equipment. Um, you know, this thing is it would cut right through my hand um, if I let it if I put my hand in a dangerous position, which is why I don't do that. So, and then when I set it, I just need to make sure that this thing is deep enough um, such that it's cutting the piece completely um, down to the, just down to the edge of the blade basically is all I want. So I usually just look down the edge of the blade um, and down the edge of the, um, uh, the top part here, the, the, the table part of the router. So it doesn't cut a groove into my uh, material, but I also wanted to make sure that it's getting the whole blade. Um, so it's actually cutting the whole thing. It's pretty good. If it gets a little bit of an edge, that's okay. Um, I can sand it out. If it doesn't cut enough, I'll have to redo it. So, and then 
you just need to make sure that it's tightened all the way on. Relatively simple to do. Um, you also note that I was um, clamping everything in between um, running the, um, the router over the edge of it. Um, that's just because I have to put some pressure on it. Um, the other thing I still need to do is um, I should actually round these edges too. So um, I'll probably have to switch that back and do those, but I wanted to get the face rounded first and then I'll go back and round these. I could also round these just by sanding them. Um, and I may just do that instead. Uh, we'll just see how it goes. It's not that hard to, sound, uh, to sand an edge like this down. It actually sands down very quickly. But routering it actually um, makes the distribution of the curve more even. So sometimes I'll start by doing a router, a quick pass with the router, and then, um, and then I'll sand it. So I'm going to have to sand it anyway. All right, let's put the big round on and see how it makes it look. Now that I have this on here, I can plug it back in. Never ever uh, handle the router blade when it's not when it's plugged in. That's always going to be problematic. Um, it's kind of hard to turn it on. You have to you'd have to make a pretty big, um, you know, the, the switches here. You'd have to make a pretty big mistake to do it. But you don't want to have your hands anywhere near that thing. Um, it's easily the most dangerous thing in my um, in my wood shop most of the time. So, all right. Uh, back to being muted. You get a little bit of a sound while I get the loud instrument.
All right, feels good in the hands. So the only thing I still have to do is basically the edges here, um, the, the long ax edge, edges. And uh, I think I might just do those with the sander. Um, I'll just coarsely sand them down real quick um, to get rid of the corners that are on here, which are you know awkwardly sharp relative to the rest of it, which is nice and smooth. And then uh, we can do away with the router, right? We're just down to sanding at this point. Um, the uh, primary tool that I use for sanding, I don't like doing it by hand. hands don't like it when I sand by hand, um, is this oscillating uh, sander that I have right here. So uh, the nice thing about it is um, when you turn it on, the face of it is a, ran it's a random orbit um, sander. So um, it won't leave um, marks in the wood from the sanding itself because it moves around randomly basically and it rotates as it does it. And then the little holes that are in the bottom here, um, it uses those to actually vacuum up the dust and it traps the dust in the, um, in the back end of it here. So there's a, um, a dust capture system, which is also very nice because I don't want to have, um, I don't have to breathe the dust either. So, uh, and then you can, um, you can see that you can, and these are actually just um, Velcro basically, um, and you can, Belt her on a different piece of, um, of sanding paper, however um, coarse or fine you want it. Hey, Zwei, how's it going? And Scott, ZXC, now you want a router. All right, well, um, I actually think that it's, you know, it's a good device to have for any woodworking um, uh, system. And um, what I'm gonna put on right now is the 120 grit um, really, anything that's like coarser than about a hundred grit is mostly used for shaping wood. In other words, um, you need to get rid of a bunch of wood mass. And um, once you get into sort of the hundred range, you're mostly looking at um, just finishing it or smoothing it down. And my normal process is to start with um, 120, which is this grit, because um, I already have it in the right shape. Um, I don't need to do any reshaping of the of the wood, and so I'll start with a 120, and then I'll go up to a 160 or 180 or a 220, um, and then up to a 300, and, um, and then it'll be soft. At that point, it'll be super soft. So um, one thing that I would warn you about is um, using 120 on a corner will basically um, remove it instantly. So. Um, even with the coarser stuff, even if I had a 220 on there and I ran it up and down the edges of these, it basically will grind away the wood very quickly on a corner. Um, it's meant for being used on flat surfaces, and so the closer, the stronger you put it onto an edge, or the, or the stronger the edges that you're putting it onto, rather, um, the faster it cuts. And so, yeah, you got to be very careful. Um, anything up, even at, even 220 basically will, um, will remove parts of your edge that you may not want to get rid of. So, uh, and very quickly. So, all right, so um, this is pretty simple. I'm gonna run it around um, the surface of it. Back a little bit so you can kind of see what I'm doing. Um, I'm just gonna plug it in. And um, these are pretty safe as well. I don't ever feel like I'm in danger. I occasionally put my hand on it while it's moving because you have to kind of like push hard on it to, uh, 
to hurt yourself with it. I don't, don't recommend putting the sanding machine on your body, but um, it's pretty hard to hurt yourself with it. Um, I can hurt my, my piece, um, so I will probably go back to um, clamping it down as best I can. Um, and, and keeping it from basically, because I need to have surface area, so I'll just have to spin it around, sand it, and spin it around again. All right, so uh, we're going radio silent on my end again. You'll just have to listen to some music because sander makes a lot of noise as well. Okay. And I don't think you want to hear that part.
Hey science, how's it going? Welcome in. <laughs> What's going on, Susie? Uh, thank you for subscribing. I saw that you did that yesterday. Um, it's very kind of you. Uh, you don't need to do that, of course. Um, uh, we're working on this uh, kalimba for Little Choop. I think you know Little Choop, right? Um, uh, Susie? So, um, I have, it's, uh, it's looking pretty sharp right now. Uh, it's going good. How's my day? My day's been pretty good. Um, it's the Thursday before the last day of finals. So Friday's the last day of school, basically. Um, so that's pretty good. Yeah, it's starting to really shape up. Um, and then we're just in the final sanding phase, basically. And then I've got to put hardware on, but the hardware's not here yet. So, um, I'm going to swap out our, uh, our sanding, uh, from, it's on a 120 right now, and I'm going to swap it out for, um, the next finest grid, um, that I want to use, which is probably, uh, a 180 or a 220. Buy this in like a giant pack of about several hundred, and then two twenties probably what I'm going to use. Um, there's no more shaping that needs to be done. Um, we're just at the point where we're finishing up the um, the surface appearance of it. Uh, a tip for people who are trying to learn how to sand with an orbital sander, like if you don't have one of these, I actually, this is my favorite, favorite tool. Um, just because it, it means I'm at the end of the project usually, and it also means that um, I don't have to sand it with my hands because uh, that was always my least favorite part. A lot of the things that I made early on when I first started woodworking, I would get it to the point where it kind of looked good, do the router, um, get it down to like, you know, the coarse sanding I would probably do by hand. Um, but the fine sanding was just like a, such a pain for me. Uh, my hands just get tired pretty quickly. I'm an old dude. So um, uh, my wife usually would do the sanding and then she almost always did all the finishing for us as well. So, um, so she would do all of the polyurethane coating or if it's painting, she would do the painting. Um, and she would have to sand it down and manage all the sanding um, just because I, I refused to do it. Um, but once I got the orbital sander, basically, uh, now I just sand it all the way down. And uh, I'm trying to learn the... Um, uh, I'm a little bit better at, at doing the clear coating, but we're not going to do any clear coating for tonight. So, yeah, sanding just sucks. It's just the worst. Uh, it's hard on my hands and, uh, and you have to wear like a respirator usually or something. Um, and it, you know, it, it's just painful to do, but with the orbital sander, um, it's, it's nice. Um, uh, one thing I was going to say is you don't have to push hard, uh, when you're using this, you just have to kind of hold it over. Um, it has to be touching it obviously, but you don't need to like grind on things like the way you would if you're actually sanding it by hand. So, um, so that's what's nice about it. Um, so we're just gonna um, bring this down a little bit so that the grain, um, so you can't feel it. For you guys, it won't look like I'm doing anything because you can't really see um, any difference in it when I sand it down, although maybe it will make the, um, the wood will look a little bit lighter. Uh, and then I'm gonna run over it again with, so this is 220 and I've got some 320, um, which is basically the final sanding coating. And then uh, we'll do some, we'll do one coat of the oil um, I've got some, just to be completely honest about what happens with these things, there's some tiny little gaps um, along the seams of these. You know, the edge of these have some tiny little gaps. And a lot of times what I do is um, I'll collect some of this really fine powder and some wood glue and I'll kind of push it into the gaps along the edges. Um, some of them are actually wood glue edges. so. It's really hard to see. Um, just the seam here between the woods kind of has like a tiny gap in some places. Um, and I feel like I can get in there and um, push some wood into the, um, the seam so that it's perfectly uh, level. 
and with a little bit of wood glue basically you can um, uh, it's like making that wood putty stuff basically that goes in there so uh, working with resin I start with 300 and go up to a thousand yeah the the wet sanders um, you know uh, they start at uh, yeah 300 or something um, if you're doing wet dry sanding so I've never used resin so um, I'd like to see some of your products. I haven't seen you stream, Susie. I just see you're uh, hanging out with me in cold ham. So, all right, uh, I'm gonna mute you guys. I'm gonna do the uh, the 220, and then I'll probably unmute you for a second while I um, switch out the sanding pads to the 330, and then uh, we'll, we're basically done at that point. I'm gonna put a layer of oil on it, and uh, and then maybe this, tonight, if I feel like there's some little seams I can fill. Um, I'll do those and sand them down again with some 300 and then put another coat of oil and another coat of oil. Um, and then tomorrow we'll just, I won't stream it, but I'll just drill the, um, the holes for the hardware and then mount the hardware on and tune it. And then basically I can send it off to Little Juke. Um, it'll be ready to be played by that point. So, all right, so I'm gonna get ahead of myself. Um, you can hang out and watch me sand for a little bit and then we'll do the nice, uh, when I put the oil on, you'll actually see the color of the wood. I think it will actually be really nice, so. Uh, hey Tagish, you don't have to worry about uh, um, actually hitting your fingers with the, um, the <laughs> they can't see yeah. you, honey. Oh. You need to be like, yeah, there, you can be down and they can see you when you're down there. Um, you don't actually need to worry about hitting your fingers with the sander. I actually hit my fingers a bunch of times while I was streaming right here. It doesn't hurt. Um, if, you're, if you hit just the edge of this paper, um, you're not going to cut yourself with it. Um, uh, I do it all the time. I mean, just you don't want to hold your hand under there and, and grind on it, but uh, just touching your hand is not going to hurt you. Um, the sander is your friend. Uh, if if you just you know play it safe with your hands and don't put it someplace stupid, you know, do this, you're going to be hurting yourself. But otherwise, you'll be fine. Um, right. So three thirty, three twenty. I have some three twenty. Um, this is the actually uh, the other sandpaper. I almost never actually have to. 
uh, replace, but you can only get like one use out of these because they're so fine basically that using them once then causes you to um, you grind all the sand off of them basically after one try. So um, I'm going to mute the sound and then run the sander. Okay, but where's the brush? <laughs> I don't know where the brush is, honey. You're going to try to clean up behind me while I'm doing this? Okay, no, don't walk through there. Okay. Sylvia, there's too much stuff over there, okay? Go around the other way. She's getting uh, ear protection, so. All right, I got the 320 on. Uh, I'm gonna meet you guys for a little bit, and Sylvia's gonna try to clean up behind me, apparently, so. Uh, don't sweep up all the stuff that's down here. I might need some of the stuff that's down here. Okay, don't do this part.
All right. So that's it. It's basically sanded down to a completely soft finish. Um, 330 or 320 or whatever I'm using here is um, it's it just feels like um, it just feels like a, like the softest piece of wood. Um, I think anything finer than that's probably just wasting your effort. But buttery smooth, yeah. Um, so the last thing we'll do before we end the stream, because uh, I don't have the hardware yet um, to put on there. Um, if I did, we could just go ahead and mount it on there. But um, putting the tines on is actually kind of a pain in the butt, and tuning it is actually kind of a pain in the butt. So um, best if you don't watch me get aggravated by that. Um, but I do have this. Uh, um, this is uh, vitamin E oil. Um, I bought this at the local grocery store. Um, but you can get it um, anywhere. It's actually sort of sweet almond oil or some kind of an almond oil extract. Um, what's good about it is uh, it will let you see the actual, um, keep the finish of the wood. Um, you have to use this kind of oil though, um, or else it can go rancid. So you don't want to use any of those other things like tea tree oil or anything that, um, this is basically the only thing that's really safe to use. Um, you don't want the, um, the oil to spoil basically. And um, what it's going to do is preserve the wood. So it needs to basically soak into the wood. And, um, and so usually I need to put like five or six coats of it on. And I wait a couple of hours between each application. And sometimes I'll actually wipe it off with a cloth in between. Um, but to really get it to, uh, to effectively penetrate the wood deeply enough. And then, you know, this wood's only about, as I mentioned, about a quarter of an inch thick. So, um, you know, there's only so much oil we could pack into the pore spaces here. But yeah, um, cutting boards are actually a little bit different. For cutting boards, you want to use like a beeswax and there's some special oils you can use that um, will work with cutting boards. Um, those are good for things that you're going to be um, uh, watertight sealing basically. So um, our cutting board we have, um, a cutting board I use this um, butcher block conditioner um, for cutting boards but I wouldn't use it for this because it's um, it's not designed for things that don't get wet um, and it might change the sound and then I also have some of this cutting board oil that, that we would use for that as well so the combination of those two things will preserve a cutting board you want to make sure that the wood doesn't get dry, basically, and crack. So um, this will actually let us do that. So um, we can actually just put some on here. Um, it seems like I'm doing something horrendous, but um, actually, this is what you want to do. And um, and then just wipe it around a little bit, so and you can see the actual um, color of the wood this way, the way it's going to look when it's finished. So I really like the. Um, the appearance and um, it's going to keep that soft wood sort of feel. Um, it's going to really make the paduk stand out um, so you can see how pretty that wood actually is. And um, the maple, which is the other wood that's here, despite the fact that it's hard maple and it's really um, dense wood, actually does most of the, soaks up most of the oil when I do this, um, almost every time I notice that basically it's the, um, the thing that's doing most of the absorbing, um, especially after the first coat. And the other thing that's really nice about this stuff that I'm using is, um, so you can really see what it does to the wood um, in terms of the way the natural wood color shows up versus the back, which I haven't done yet. So you can see how bright orange that is. <laughs> Studio says hi, Sylvia. Oh, yeah, hi. <laughs> she's, she's hiding around the bottom of this, uh, trying to clean stuff up for me. Um, so it'll, it'll bring out all the green and the color um, will look good. And I might actually want to try to get some of it inside of here, which I can't normally do just because um, the inside of the, um, the kalimba is actually exposed uh, a little bit. You can see into it, e even with the tines on there. So, um, and then I'm going to have to do a little bit more um, 
on the uh, oh, little chooks here, and she also says hi, Sylvia. She waved at you. There you go. So what it's going to look like, little chook. Hopefully you like that color. Uh, really bold uh, paduk together with a really bright. Um, yeah, that came out. So I'm going to let this sit for a while, um, but it's basically ready. And then um, in about an hour or two, I'll probably put another coat of oil on. Oh, you're muted. Okay. I thought you said I was muted. I was like, am I muted? I think people can hear me. So um, that's the way it will look. Uh, minus quite, it won't have quite the same sheen to it, but it's just going to feel like wood. And the other thing that's really great about this stuff, um, I was trying to, to mention that, is it smells amazing and it's meant for moisturizing your skin. So um, the more you handle it, the more your hands will smell like almonds and um, actually will moisturize your hands a little bit while you're using it. But it's meant to keep the oil from your hands from getting into the, uh, the wood and causing it to become, um, uh, you know, creating problems. Your husband uses that as hair treatment. Yeah, I mean, it's actually really nice. It smells great. And um, I made some of those uh, uh, musical shakers and I put some of this on it and I had one of them because uh, I was doing it while I was at school to try to um, get it ready to send to Hannah. And um, uh, one of my students wanted to, um, to shake it. And so I let them have it and they were like, oh my God, this smells so good. So as an advantage, uh, not only does it sound good, and look good. It smells good. So, um, but here's the, the body of it. It's complete. Um, and then we're just gonna put the harbor on tomorrow when the pieces come. So, I'll try to get rid of that glare for you so you can actually see it. Uh, it's gonna be the same as this one. It'll have um, it'll have 17 tines on it, and uh, we'll sound probably pretty similar. Um, the sound doesn't change very much. It's mostly in the sounding board part. This actually kind of, the body has a resonant sound to it, but um, you know, it, it won't matter that much. So yeah, it's going to be exciting. And then um, I'll probably record a little video of me playing it uh, once I have the, the tines on it. And let's see if I can, the, the light glare is uh, intense, but I think you can see really clearly what it's going to look like now. It's got a like a really bold orange and um, and light color. So, um, but we'll put the tines and then basically tune it, and it'll be ready to go. What are you up to? You want to tell everybody what you've been doing today? Um, cleaning. Besides cleaning, what were you doing when I came home? Um, I watched Star Wars. You watched Star Wars. The first movie for the first time. It's actually the fourth movie. We started them in the right order. Thanks, ball machine. I think it is looking great. What? It started out as a piece of wood yesterday, like just a piece of wood that I had glued, edge glued the pieces on. And uh, we started the stream, we cut the shapes, we put the, uh, the edge boards on, uh, we cut the hole in the middle, and then uh, I glued it up overnight. And uh, and today we have a, the body of a kalimba. So, and it's super smooth silky smooth soft and smells like almonds now so say what now about star wars i didn't say anything about star wars but the movie uh, i said we watch you're watching them in the chronologic order not in the movie order but the order that they came out oh yeah because they came out four five and then six then one two and three and then seven eight and nine that's odd it is odd but it's the way they wanted to tell the story I think we're gonna watch all of them somehow. Are you about to end the stream? Yeah, I'm about to end the stream. I gotta find somebody to raid. It's over. We got. What else am I gonna do? It's a woodworking stream, and my project is done. What What else could we do than end the stream? I clean. Yeah, I know you're cleaning. Yeah. That's not a surprise. All right. Um, thanks everybody for hanging out and. Um, yeah, tagish degrees, that's the best way to watch them. So, 
Um, let me see who's on that we could raid. Hopefully there's a friend on somewhere. Um, uh, let's see. Maybe, not, maybe, let's see, Glorgana looks like she's doing some puzzle. Spring Moss is doing some knitting. If you go to knitting, uh, that might be a nice transition to go from woodworking to knitting. And the other choice is Numb the Geek. Uh, but let's, or we could go to Joe Plays Violin. Uh, any of those would be fine. Uh, let's just see what we can do here. Part of the wood that's red looks really pretty. Yeah. Uh, who do you think we should go raid? Um, knitting, violin. Knitting. You like the knitting? Yeah. Okay. Gotta check how to spell Spring Moss's name here. <laughs> Spring Space Moss. We're gonna go look at knitting. That was Sylvia's choice. And I want to thank everybody for hanging out, uh, chatting with me, uh, watching me uh, build the uh, the kalimba. And um, I'm going to build something else sometime soon here. Uh, but for now, this is probably the last woodworking stream for a little while. Uh, unless I decide to make some more musical shakers. Hey, Devil and Mrs. J. Hopefully you're doing well. We're going to go raid Spring Moss. Yeah, that worked. And uh, she's doing some knitting. That's what Sylvia wanted, so that's what we do. Um, thanks for hanging out and uh, and watching the stream. And uh, hopefully this was entertaining. And um, we'll catch you next time. Oh, I guess my uh, music's coming through the speakers bye. now. You want to tell them bye? Bye.